Thank you for listening to the Conform to Christ podcast, where we seek to engage the mind, affect the heart, and call people to follow Christ. I'm Jay Jones, and I am here with George Mays for a text-driven Tuesday, where we are going over Hebrews chapter 4, verses 3 through 10, and this is the second in the warning passage mini-series. Okay. That's how I'm looking at it. Okay. We're in the second warning passage. Uh Uh-huh. You've got... Is it three to cover the one yes. passage? This was the second. Yes. Yep. So good times. How was the rest of your Sunday before we jump in? <laughs> We've already talked about the oh. the rest of my Sunday. I think they want to know. <clears throat> Do they? I mean, they already had the uh, they already had the free for all Friday gross out episode. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> Everything was fine. Everything yep. was fine until about four o'clock and. Josiah walks into the living room and Josiah, how how old is Josiah now? He three? will be thir- he three he'll be old? three in March. He'll be yeah. three in March. Mm-hmm. He comes up to Julia and says, I spit. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I'm I'm uh I was reading. I was reading something. And then all of a sudden she's like, Oh no, he's throwing up, he's throwing up. <laughs> uh, it was it was almost cartoonish in how far <laughs> <laughs> <It went. laughs> and how much he must have he must have been going for almost a minute it's crazy it was it was really 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 bad oh, man. and i am incredibly thankful for my wife <laughs> <laughs> because at that moment i was ready to burn the whole house down <laughs> and just move <laughs> oh man but she was very uh, she was very calm and collected and uh, she she went about uh, cleaning and ordering me <laughs> around to where I needed to yeah. to be because I I don't know is it just a dad thing How are you when your kids are sick Do you do you yeah. just kind of like That's blank out and you're like uh, I don't even know I don't even know you know who I am anymore I just blank yeah. out That's an Angie thing Yeah you know she's good with it I, I feel like like baby throw up. That's like nothing to a woman. That's like that'd be like if we spilled a cup of water on us. <laughs> That's what I feel like for them. They've been they've been getting thrown up on since the time these this is from the, the time these babies came this, out. This is the worst for me, toddler. <laughs> when a toddler's sick, yeah, because they are mobile, but they are not they developed enough to know yeah. I need to seek out. Like a trash can or a yeah. or a bathroom, so right. it's just it's like uh, it's like a sprinkler head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So that was uh, that took up probably about an hour. Wow. That's <laughs> your Sunday to, evening to clean up, and then he was he was sick. He was sick the rest of, of the night. He was didn't have anything else to come up, but he he was he was sick. Mm. So, not uh, not a, a super relaxing after after preaching a sermon on rest. I oh, did not. <laughs> I did not have a very restful afternoon. Was he was he in the nursery? He was. Oh man! Uh, for so the, sun, for sun, well, he was in Sunday school. Okay. He was in Sunday school. So the rest. It's just going around. The rest of I us. I mean, he could have gotten it from someone here. Uh, like on Wednesday, I don't know. Evangeline may be next. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What's going around? There's nothing. There's he no wasn't. One. He wasn't in the nursery because um, uh, Abigail was not feeling well, so we kept her away from church. We thought she was the. She. You thought she. Was the we thought she was the one that we needed mm. to keep home because he was fine. Um, he was fine all morning. That's how, and, the, little, and, that's how the little ones do it, though. Man. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's no warning. Yeah. Um, so we kept her home. So Julia did Sunday school and then came home, and I came for the service. And uh, so she took Josiah with with her. So he wasn't in the nursery. He was in Sunday school, though. So for anyone that was in the Sunday school uh, class with Josiah yesterday, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's no, he's fine. He's fine this morning. There's as no far warning. as I as far as I know, he's fine. So it yeah. was um, it was about uh, I don't know five or six hours. Yeah. And then he fell asleep and he woke up just fine this morning so hopefully it was just a quick intense they get over it but so quick, quick. It's, uh, it's sad though it's sickness. always sad to watch them oh yeah when they're suffering like that yeah you can't help them and but then they're they're over it so fast comes on fast goes away fast mm-hmm. yeah i was i'm 
I was wondering last night, who's next? <laughs> Is it going to be me? Is it going to be Julia? Just, I'm just assuming that one of us, uh, one of us are are going to fall. But so far, so far, so good. Moms are kind of impervious to baby throw up, though. They probably want to like bounce off of her and deflect it on you, and probably, <laughs> probably. You're next. Yeah, I, I, I'm just wondering if it's if is this just a dad thing? Like we just see we just see this and we just, um, just shut down. <laughs> like I'm I'm non functioning. <laughs> I need to be told where to go and what to do because I I I just don't know. How was your How was your Sunday afternoon and evening, Jay? My Sunday I saw a pic- afternoon. I saw a picture of you on Facebook. It was uh, so delightful. Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Mine was so delightful, George. I took a long nap. Yeah. And I don't know how Evangeline didn't wake me up because she doesn't take naps. Yeah. So she must have been playing with one of my other kids in their room because uh, I, I didn't hear. So I had a deep, long nap. It was awesome. Congratulations. I feel well, I'm real, well I'm real, rested. I'm real happy I'm for I'm well you. rested I'm today. real happy for you, Jay. I'm well rested. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's jump into here then. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4. If you've got your Bible, Hebrews chapter 4. George will begin reading at verse 3. And uh, how far will you go? 3 go through 10. 10. Yeah. Yeah. 3 through 10. And then we'll talk about it. Kind of an interesting one, talking about uh, God's rest, mm-hmm. or some people would say Sabbath. Uh-huh. Uh, so we'll we'll get into some of these discussions right. and, and uh, talk, talk about it. Okay. Uh, what we need to to remember as we go into this is that, like you said, it's in the middle of the warning passage. So this mm-hmm. is a longer warning passage. It goes from chapter three, verse seven, to chapter four, verse thirteen, and we're we're right in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And so we we kind of we have to remember the context of that. Okay. So Hebrews chapter four, uh, beginning in verse three, for we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So let me break out the notes here. I got one extra step because my tablet broke uh, in the corner. So I took these notes on my phone. Um, what are you gonna like, do, What are you gonna do without your without your your tablet, yeah, man? I'm gonna have to get that maybe get that phone tablet thing. Yeah, maybe time maybe time to upgrade. I I thought about trying to tough it out with these cracks in the screen, but I use the I use a tablet like a lot. Yeah. Um, I take notes on a tablet like every day. I read from it, yeah, and I preach off of it. My notes are on it, so I don't know if I can if I can stare through those cracks. I just, you know, I never have to worry uh, about that, Jay. Yeah, I know. (laughs) But here's the um, the beauty of it, though, is now, like, so I I have all of my sermons in a folder on uh, Google Drive, and so anywhere I'm at, I've got them in my pocket. Yeah, that's the that's the one benefit of it. But I'm getting to where I go less and less notes. So I suppose if I'm at this another twenty years. I'll be at no notes. That's the goal, right? That's the goal. That's what I. That's where I'd like to be. Yeah. So we'll see. But I took notes on my phone for you, and I liked how you started this. You started this with a puzzle illustration, mm-hmm. and you uh, you kind of brought up you know people like puzzles, but imagine like if you if you didn't have the picture of the puzzle box, yeah, and you just had a bunch of pieces, and you're trying to figure out how to put them together, but you have no idea like what the actual whole picture is that you're supposed to be putting together, right? And you kind of said that's how a lot of people read their Bibles, and I like that uh, because that introduced the... that's that's how I used to read my Bible. I don't know about you, but um, that's 
that's kind of how I was taught growing up in a Southern Baptist church. Right. Um, in Sunday school, you just get these, you just get the stories. You just get random stories, mm -hmm. and there's no, there's no cohesion to it. Mm -hmm. And that's a, uh, I think a lot of people, they grow up in church hearing all these stories. And so they're, they're familiar with these stories. They're familiar with, um, Abraham, uh, sacrificing Isaac. They're familiar with David and Goliath or mm -hmm. Daniel in the lion's den. And, and they, they know the stories, but if you were to ask them, okay, why is that there? <laughs> what, what is it teaching us? They'll probably give you some moral lesson, right? Instead of seeing how they all tie together and tell one story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. So when I was when I was approaching this text, I was I stopped and I was like, I don't know if if everyone's going to be able to follow what's going on here because I don't know if they've ever really thought about how this theme all fits together. How, how this isn't this is not just popping out of of the first century right and the, the author of hebrews is just coming up with this new idea this idea has been traced from the very beginning of the bible mm -hmm. and so i thought i i really because he's just assuming that his his audience knows the big the big idea mm -hmm. but i couldn't do that and so i had to I had to trace it. I had to, I had to, where he condenses it, I had to expand it mm -hmm. and start showing those pieces and how they fit together. Right. Yeah. So, so one of my goals for the sermon was not just here's Hebrews 4, 3 through 10, I want you to understand it, but I want you to understand your whole Bible better. Right. And so hopefully people came away at least saying, I see, I see how it, how it fits. Yeah. You really, you really need to understand how it fits in order to get, to get at this meaning of it, yeah. uh, of this passage, right? So you um, you introduce the idea of biblical theology, which is that we've talked about it on here before. Yep. tracing a, a theme, mm -hmm. you, you may would trace the theme of the seed, the promised seed, uh -huh. um, tabernacle, tabernacle, sacrifice, a king. Mm -hmm. You right. can do this a number of ways. Trace it all the way through, right? Uh, yeah, and. and then you get a really good idea, like oh, God's communicated in a whole variety of ways to help us to understand. And and we can do this because we have the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So the New Testament is the apostolic witness to how all the pieces fit together. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus, on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, he tells his disciples, he, he starts with Moses and all the prophets, and he shows how all the scriptures are pointing to him, how they all, all are talking about him. Um, and so they, they teach that, they teach that way mm -hmm. and they explain it to the, the believers. And so they, it's like, they have the, they have the, the picture. And so we can now go back and we can start seeing it. Oh yeah. Here's, here is how it's, how it's fitting together. So the way that revelation comes to God's people is progressively. Mm -hmm. So Moses is, he's given the pieces and the story is there, but they only have some of the pieces. Mm -hmm. And so as they go along, uh, Joshua and Judges and Samuel and Kings, you're, you're getting more and more of the, of the pieces, more of the story, until you come to, here's Jesus, and this is what it all, this is what all the pieces are, are fitting together to reveal. Mm -hmm. um, so we read the Bible as Christians. I, I'm always encouraging people, when you read your Old Testament, don't read it like, like, unbelieving Jews <laughs> read it like a Christian because you live in the, the New Testament era. And so you, you've got this, you've got all of the pieces. So don't, don't say, well, I can't, I can't get at the meaning if I bring in the New Testament. No, that's, that's the way that you're supposed to, right. to read it. That's how Jesus and the apostles want you to read the old Testament. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to, they don't want you to act like you don't know the end of the story. Right. They, they expect you to take the end and then say, "Oh, this is what it. This is what it really means." Mm -hmm. um, Jesus brings he he pronounces blessings on the scribe who brings out of his storehouse the 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 new with the old. Mm -hmm. um, so he blesses those who are understanding that all of the old is pointing towards the new, and so now that we have the new, we can go back and we can really get the the fullness 
of what's going on in the old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Okay, so that was what first you gave a, a general overview, biblical theology of God's rest, which we'll do here in just a second. And then there were four questions coming, like with that information in mind, when you come to the text, four questions to present and then answer. So we'll follow what you did, and we'll move through. So let's uh, quickly give a theology of God's rest, because I, I think maybe we'll have room to have other discussions and stuff coming off of this, but mm -hmm. do the same thing you did, um, just a, a quick, brief theology of God's rest, which begins in the beginning of the Bible, right? Yep. Genesis. That, I was really I was really kind of anxious about doing this, this part of the sermon, because... Um, anybody that took my has taken any Sunday school classes with me doing biblical theology know that I can just <laughs> I can just start start talking and I, I was afraid it was going to turn into a long biblical theology instead of a brief one. Um, but yeah, the the author here in in chapter four he he re references Genesis chapter two, uh -huh. so we've got to go back to Genesis chapter two and we got to see the first instance of rest, right? So God um, he. He finished his work, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his works. Uh -huh. All right, so we've got um, chapter one of Genesis uh, telling us of God's creation, six-day creation. Chapter two, verses one through three, God rests from all of his works, and he blesses the seventh day and, and makes it holy because on that day he rests from his works. This is, four, and this is chapter, a, this chapter is, Hebrews this, chapter four verse four uh -huh. references that right. Um, what's interesting is when you look at that throughout chapter one, as God is creating on the six days, there is a common refrain. There's evening and there's morning the first day, evening and morning the second day, and and so so on. But when you come to the seventh day, there is no there is no evening and morning. Mm -hmm. So what is um, what is implied and what I think the author of Hebrews is picking up on is that this is supposed to be um, an unending day. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not literally evening and morning. It means that theologically, God has entered into his rest, and now mankind is invited to enter that rest with him. Mm hmm Right. That's and that's that's what the, the author of Hebrews is doing. He's picking up on that idea and he's saying God God has has um, looked at his creation, he has pronounced it as very good, he is satisfied with it, and now he's inviting humanity to be satisfied in him. Mm -hmm. And that that would have been the perfect the perfect end. Mm -hmm. Right. But of course in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, they rebel against God, and so instead of experiencing his rest, instead they're thrust out of the garden, and they have to endure pain and hardship and toil. And so they, they'll, they will um, you know, eat by the sweat of their brow. So that's not, that's not rest. Mm -hmm. um, it's toil. Um, but in the midst of God um, cursing them and, and um, forcing them out of Eden, he gives a promise that there's coming a, a, a child who will crush the head of the serpent, and he's going to reverse this curse. So this this is not the end. There's a promise of restoration, but it's going to come through a child. When you get to chapter 5, you see that God's people are anticipating, and, and they're looking forward to this child. So Lamech, in Genesis chapter 5, he names his son Noah, because he says, this one will give us rest. Uh. So for whatever reason, I, I don't know why he looks at Noah and, and thinks this, but he names, he names him Noah because Noah means rest. So he's looking for this. He's looking for the seed of the woman right. who will bring rest. Now, of course, Noah does not bring rest. Yeah, he was <laughs> right. only so, off by like <laughs> 180 <laughs> degrees. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, instead of bringing rest, I mean, there is rest for the land uh, right. as the wicked are, are yeah. destroyed in the flood. So there is a, a kind of rest. But Noah comes out of the of the ark and he brings his sin with him. And so Genesis chapter nine is Noah getting drunk on on fruit and revealing his nakedness. Mm -hmm. It's it's just replaying Genesis three mm -hmm. over again. Um, so there's no rest. And you, you go through Genesis ten and eleven and Tower of Babel and, and there's no rest. Um, people are are cursed to wonder 
uh, around the world. They're, they're not at rest. But uh, God gives promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that um, an offspring is going to come, and there's going to be the promise of land and blessings to the nations. And in other words, there's going to be rest. This mm-hmm. is this is ultimately going to lead to the promised child of Genesis three fifteen. Um, but again, it, it comes through the offspring, right? Um, and then we we fast forward because we're doing a brief biblical theology, right? And we mm-hmm. come to the Exodus. God brings his people out of slavery um, in Egypt, and in Exodus 33, 14, God tells Moses, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So this is um, the promise that he's going to bring them into the land of Canaan, and this is where his rest is going to be. This is where they're going to experience uh, the presence of God. They're going to be in fellowship with him, and they're going to be living under God's law, and it's going to be, it's supposed to be a land of righteousness, right? Um, but we, we saw last week that when Israel came to the, the border of, of the land of Canaan, they refused uh-huh. to enter God's rest. They saw the giants and they yeah. said, we're not going to, we're not going to do it. And so God curses them. And instead of giving them rest, they die in the wilderness. What does that sound like? It sounds like eating all over again, right? Uh-huh. Um, except they didn't actually, <laughs> they didn't, they didn't come into the garden paradise. Uh, they saw the garden paradise and said, no, thanks. And so they die in the wilderness, um, and they're outside of God's rest. Uh, but that's that's not the end. God promises that their their children will enter into the promised land. So Deuteronomy twelve, uh, Deuteronomy twenty twenty five, um, again and again, God is promising, "I'll bring you into rest when you come into the land, and I give you rest." So the promise is reiterated over and over and over again, and rest is tied in with the land. So we, we, kinda, we have to get that, that these two ideas, they go together. So rest is the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. Rest is the promised land. Um, and Exodus 31, God, God gives to Israel his Sabbath, the, the weekly Sabbath, which is a reminder of Genesis 2 mm-hmm. and God's rest. So every week they're reminded of this rest, and so they're supposed to rest from their labors as they're they're looking back to to that rest. Mm-hmm. Um, Joshua chapter one verse thirteen: Moses is dead; the forty years are over. Joshua is about to lead them into the promised land, and he says, "Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest, and will give you this land.'" Mm-hmm. So the, the promises over and over and over again. What's interesting is Joshua chapter 20, uh, 21, verses 43 through 45. Um, it says, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. I was going to ask you about that, because there are some people who would say today that Israel never occupied all the land God gave to them. Right. Where do they... Where I haven't read a lot into dispensational stuff. Where does this idea come from? Because that seems pretty clear to me. <laughs> right. Um, I think there's a tension. I think there's a tension through Joshua and Judges. Uh-huh. So in Judges, um, they the people of the land they they failed to they failed to give them or to to um, defeat all the all the enemies. Right. They they start to compromise. Uh-huh. Um, they start to. Um, I mean, even Dan is pushed back. Uh-huh. <laughs> they're supposed to go in, and they they're pushed back, and they they kind of just dwell with the people of of Canaan. So there's a there's a tension. On one hand, Joshua brings them into this rest. And if they would have been obedient, they they would have. They would have uh, so again, it's because of their sin that they failed to enter into God's full rest. So I think you're you're seeing this tension between all of God's promises come true. Um, not only in Joshua but in Kings, Solomon says the same thing. Mm-hmm. That all of God's promises to Israel have come true, that they're in the land, that their enemies have not withstood them, that they experience the blessings of covenant faithfulness. The problem is 
they don't remain in covenant faithfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of Joshua, Joshua is reminding them of their covenant obligations, and they say, oh, we'll obey. And Joshua says, no, you won't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't. Right. Because God is holy and you guys are not going to be faithful. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we will. And he sets up a, an altar and a monument and says, this this rock, this stone is going to be witness against you that you have said you'll follow God. Mm-hmm. And then you turn the page. <laughs> and Joshua, or judge, you know, Judges tells of all the ways in which Israel fell. Right. And so I, I think that's what's going on. Mm-hmm. I think you, you, gotta, you have to live with this tension because you remember the story is still going. Mm-hmm. Right? Joshua is not the seed of the woman, right? So the rest is always tied with the Messiah. And the text tells you in Hebrews that they failed to enter. Uh-huh. Joshua didn't. Bring yeah, them Joshua in. didn't bring them rest. Yeah, he he brought them into the land, and they experienced a type of rest, but they didn't experience the rest to which God has really promised. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not it's not just a little piece of land on the Mediterranean coast. It never was. That's just a picture of something else that God is going to bring in, mm-hmm. but it's always tied to the Messiah. Always. I think the problem, the failure with dispensationalism is, at least some of them, they rip the promises that are given to Israel out of the context of the Messiah is going to bring this. Mm-hmm. And so they want Israel to be in the, the promised land, regardless of whether they believe in the Messiah or not. So they, they look at you know um, 1948 and Israel being reconstituted as a, as a nation, and they say, well, that's... That's all part of God's plan. Yeah. But they're not believing in Jesus. <laughs> they're, they're not submitting to the Messiah. They want, they want these promises, but they forget that all the promises are tied to the Messiah. Uh, so I think that's a, that's, that is maybe the failure of dispensationalism, is that they, they separate the promises that God has given to Israel away from the Messiah. Yeah, I, I encountered something interesting. I, I was reading a... Uh, a book on Habakkuk, preparing to preach from Habakkuk. Really good book, incredible book, actually, very insightful. Um, but there was this uh, this kind of this retracing of the history of uh, the kings. Yeah. And so when Babylon finally comes in and destroys uh, destroys Jerusalem, carries away um, uh, carries away. Uh, all of the, all of the people. There's a period of time where some are left, but yeah. they like ransack it two more times. Yeah, the exile goes in stages, <clears throat> right? But eventually, it's totally nothing. Right. And and the, and the comment was, and there has not been a a uh, like a government in. There was not a government, a legitimate. I think the term was legitimate or something. It was strange mm. government in Israel until 19. 19- <laughs> Whatever. What, what was the date? I think it's forty eight. Nineteen forty eight. I'm just like I think forty eight's when they. I'm just like scratching my head. Uh, uh, they hadn't had a legitimate government because they'd always been occupied, uh-huh. right? They're occupied by right. Babylon, occupied by the Romans. Yeah, you know whoever else. Uh, Islam had taken over the Ottoman Empire, uh, on and on, and then they get their own country in 1948. Yeah, 1948, right? And, uh, and it's forty seven or forty eight. I don't know, but I'm thinking like. But like most of them are like atheists, yeah. Like ha- ha- this is not. It's a, this, it's a secular government. Yeah, it's so weird. It's so it's such a strange thing to think. Like, and there's no messianic king there. Uh-huh. Like, th- yeah, yeah, they. Um, uh, it's real frustrating <laughs> to talk to to like hardcore dispensationalists sometimes because they're so excited that Israel is is in the land. And I mean, you watch you watch some of these guys, um, and they are promoting like transporting Jews back to the promised land because that, you know, when they come back to the land, then all the promises will, uh, you know, come true. And they completely, they completely separate it from Jesus. Mm-hmm. And they want the promises to come first and then Jesus comes. <laughs> but it's Jesus that brings the promises because he's the only true Israelite. Mm-hmm. He's the only one that has truly obeyed God. And so all the promises they're only for him <laughs> and for those who are in him. It's not for those who are outside of him. Mm-hmm. And so you've got, you've got Joshua 21 and 
they have rest. But for those, there's still a there's still the believing Jews and the unbelieving Jews. And for the unbelieving Jews, even if they're in the promised land, they do not have God's rest. Right. Now, you brought up a passage that I thought was very, very good. Something Jesus said that I think helps to inform how to go forward interpreting the passage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Second Samuel 7, God promises David that there's going to be rest. But again, it's tied to a child, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's tied to a son. The, the son is going to bring rest. Solomon sees himself at least as a foreshadowing of that rest um, in First Kings. So when we get to, to Matthew chapter 11, what Jesus says ought to, it ought to, uh, to ring with all of this Old Testament information. Like this is what Israel's been looking for. <laughs> They've been looking for rest. Um, and so Jesus shows up. Interesting, interestingly enough, the people of Israel are in the land, mm-hmm. right? Um, but what he says seems to indicate that apart from him, they don't have it rest. doesn't matter if you're in the land, you're not going to have rest. Right. So he says, um, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's the verse? Uh, Matthew 11, verse 28, uh, 29 and 30. Mm-hmm. So come to me and I will give you rest. Right. That's a massive statement. Mm-hmm. I think we kind of we look at it and we're like, this is really good and, and really powerful. But we we fail to understand like the magnitude of what he's saying. He's, he's bringing in this idea that has been throughout from Genesis chapter 2 all the way through the Old Testament, and he's saying, come to me, and I will give you rest. Uh-huh. Not, not live in the land, not, not Abraham or Moses or Joshua. It's me. Come to me, and I will give you rest. He's, I mean, this is a Davidic, this is a Davidic king statement. Yeah. He's saying, I'm the king, because that's that's where rest was promised. It was promised um, to the king. Mm-hmm. He says, take my yoke uh, upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's a massive promise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he's he's claiming that it's in him. If you If you come to him, then you will experience the rest that has been promised throughout the, the entire scriptures. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when you get to Revelation chapter 14, um, there is this this great distinction between those who are um, worshiping the beast and who experience torment. And um, John says in Revelation 14, he says, they have no rest. Mm. But then in verse 13 of, of chapter four, 14, it says, um, write, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may have rest from their labors. So everyone's going to experience either eternal unrest or eternal rest, this blessed rest. And that's, uh, you know, Revelation 14 is it's the culmination of, of this whole story. Uh-huh. Um, and then we see the saints. The saints have rest in Revelation 21 and 22 uh-huh. in the presence of God in a new heavens and new earth. All right, so this brings up a number of questions. Before we get to the four questions that the passage brings up on how to end, uh, that, that we have that are very helpful, one I would bring up would be, what is the implications of this for Sabbath-keeping today? Mm. Sabbatarianism. I, I was think, thinking you'd hold on to that until we got to to verse nine. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's there. Yeah, like that 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 question is definitely there. Do you want to do that? Do you want me to hold off until then? Let's hold off because I I think I think I know what's going on, but again, there's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of questions, and people come to different positions. Uh huh. Okay. Well, we'll we'll just hold off because my first question that I ha- kind of had, I think we can put in kind of application for your first question. Okay. I'll hold so, on to that because he uses the word Sabbath right. in, in verse 9. Mm-hmm. And so we have to we have to understand what's going on. I didn't touch on it very much because that wasn't... I, I don't think he's talking about a day. So I read some of these reform commentary, you know, commentaries, and they seem to get to verse 9 and they... Well, hang on. Hang okay. On, oh, we'll talk. All you right, tell all me right, to hang well, on. I, I mean, you asked the question. Now you're just, getting excited. Just started thinking about it. Now you're going... All right. Okay. okay. All so right. four questions. <laughs> there are four questions that the text... Uh-huh. Kind of, we come to the text with. Right. And, and, and we're going to raise an answer. Number one, what kind of rest? Okay? Yeah. What kind of rest 
is 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 being talked about here in Hebrews. Uh, uh, when Jesus says that, I mean, I think that that would be a question that comes to my mind when He says He'll give you rest. Right. I think they're the same rest. Yeah. Well, what kind of rest are we talking about here? Yeah, I, you know, when people hear this word rest, I think that they they have this idea of kicking back and just watching watching the game. Mm. Like, I, I think that's what people think of is they think of no work. <laughs> you you don't have to do anything. Just a lazy afternoon. Mm. That's that's our idea of rest, and that's a really, really poor view of rest. Mm. That's not what's going on. When he when he talks about rest, he goes back to Genesis chapter 2, mm-hmm. and he talks about God entering his rest. What kind of rest is that? Well, it's not God getting tired, um, because God doesn't get tired. It's a rest from he's done. Like he, he doesn't have any more work. And he looks at all of his creation and he says, everything that I've created is very good. Mm -hmm. And he's satisfied. Well, now that God is satisfied in his creation, he's inviting creation to be satisfied in him, Mm -hmm. to find, to find enjoyment in him. And I think that what we do is we try to find satisfaction in everything else except for God. But God is inviting us to rest in him. Mm Mm-hmm to find our our full satisfaction and our full joy and and pleasure in him. And I think that's the rest that's being that's being um offered here. Jesus says, um come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden. What are we weary and heavy laden from? Just the burdens of life, the the um just, trying, from, yeah. just, just I mean living in a world with a fallen living in nature. A, yeah, living in a fallen world with fallen people and you're fallen yourself. And Jesus says you're not going to find rest anywhere else. I think one thing that people in the West can can understand, is, and it may be in certain degrees in other cultures too, but people people are never they never are satisfied, right? Yeah. Like if you've ever wanted something, you know, pick whatever it is, whatever floats your boat. You know, something different things drive different people. Yeah. Uh, career, uh, education, mm-hmm. attaining that level, whatever. You got the degree. Then right. what happened? Yeah, you got you got to have more, right? Yeah, you got you know you you aimed at like I need this job, I need to make this amount of money. You got it. What happened? You weren't satisfied, right? It, it didn't satisfy you, and then it became something else. Mm-hmm. People do it with material things all the time. Yeah, you know, uh, so a lot of some guys, it's like guns. They like get on a gun kick. Yeah, and I and I've had it before. Like the bug, the bug gets me. I'm like, you know what? I really do need. I need another. I need another gun. Yeah. <laughs> and and Angie's always like, but do you really? Like, yeah. eh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh-huh. Uh, and then you get it, and then after a while, yeah, it's so cool. And then after a while, you're like, I didn't really need it. Yeah. But it never stops because then it'll move to something else. Right. Um, and so you got to be careful. You got to be aware of that, but. You think about it, uh, what Jesus is offering is he's offering like, um, he's offering a way out of that cycle, to break that cycle. It's the, it's what he offers the woman at the well Mm -hmm. in John 4, right? Like people who come to this well, they're going to drink it and then they're going to be thirsty again. Mm -hmm. But the person who drinks from the water I'll give, they'll never thirst again. Yeah. And that's why she's like, give me this water. She she still thinks he's talking about yeah. you know like the fountain of youth or something right uh, he's talking about himself uh-huh. um, that's right. that's that's where you'll be satisfied mm. if you look for satisfaction in anything other than Jesus you're always going to have unrest you're always going to be dissatisfied you're always going to be seeking and wandering around and you're never going to find it and it's easy to fall back into that too even if you have experienced. That type of rest, yeah. I think most Christians have. They can identify it sometime in their Christian life where they were totally at rest and at peace. Yeah, um, the, you still live in a fallen sin nature. Like it, it's there. The flesh, like this body, cannot inherit immortality for a reason. Yeah, part of you is still linked to the fallen world, and it's pulling always. Right. Um, well, and and you know, coming back to the context of this warning passage, these Christians are experiencing difficulties and hostility directly related to them being Christians, mm-hmm. and so they're looking for some way 
out of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are Christians that will experience this. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll all be tempted to, um, you're going through some kind of hardship, you're going through some kind of suffering, there's not enough money, or you're sick, and you're looking for something other than Christ to bring you that rest. Right. Um, And in the midst of all of these options, I guess, um, Jesus says, come to me, Mm -hmm. come to me. Um, he stands up in the middle of the temple, right? Right at the end of the, of the festival. Mm -hmm. And he says, come to me, drink the, drink the living water. Yeah. You know, out out of, out of him will come what rivers of fountains, rivers of life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's found in him. It's found in him. And the problem that we have is that we often don't desire God that way. Right. It's a bit more biblical theology, yeah. water from the rock. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, this, this is the kind of rest, right? It's mm-hmm. rest from, I mean, people, people in other religions need to hear this too, because kind of the way they go about life is working to please God. Yeah. And always wondering if they've done enough to please God. A lot of Christians will will experience that also mm-hmm. because they're they are misunderstanding what Christ is offering. Mm-hmm. He's not he's not offering a bunch of rules that you have to follow in order to be right with God. He's offering himself. Mm-hmm. That that really is what the seventh day rest of Genesis two is. It's God giving himself to humanity. Mm. Um you're not just getting something from God, you're getting God. And in him is the source of all of all satisfaction. Mm-hmm. And that that's what Jesus is offering throughout the gospels. He's not saying, Come to me and, you know, do this and you'll experience some some sort of blessing that that I'll give you. It's come to me. Come to me and I I will give you rest. There's the uh the little illustration. Was it Lloyd Jones's illustration? Or was it C.S. Lewis illustration about the mud pies? It's C.S. Lewis. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's C.S. Lewis. He, I've got it right in front of me. Yeah, it's good. Will you read that? Yeah. Um, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Yeah. So you got this kid who's playing in the in this muddy street making mud pies, and he has no idea what's meant when someone comes and says, I'll take you to the beach where you can play right. in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yes, and he's, he's satisfied with playing in the mud when he could go and he could swim in the ocean. Yeah, and that, that's what we're like. I'll never forget it. Uh, this time I sat down with this this young man. I think he was uh, just turned eighteen. Had and had dinner with him, sharing the gospel with him, and he was like, uh, and he understood it too. And I, I know he understood everything. I never talked to him about any particular sins in his life, things he would have to count the cost to give up to follow Christ, any of that. He just said, I'm never going to give up having sex to follow Christ. Yeah. And and literally, it's that is the thing. I said, I just told you there's a beach <laughs> right. that has infinite greater here's the ocean you can't joy. even see you can't even see the other side it's 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 massive it's infinite and you're content to play with with mud pies right and you can't like you can't this is you know we are to present the gospel but we can't grant <coughs> people the sight right to see Christ for who he is yeah. Only the Holy Spirit does that. Right. But we should remember the Holy Spirit doesn't do that apart from us sharing the gospel with people. Yeah. People don't just wake up one day and go, Oh, Jesus is amazing. I'll follow him. Yeah. They have to hear the gospel from someone. The Holy Spirit works through that. But there's no guarantee that every time we share that he will. Some people will still be content to play with mud pies. Yeah, you you, you want to take people and just shake them and say, Do do you not realize that there is something so much better than what you're you're content with doing like you're content with just wasting your life away with uh you know sex yeah video games 
um, I mean, we entertain ourselves to death. There's infinite joy, mm-hmm. and you just want to shake them and say, "Wake up!" Right. Um, and this this brings us back to the doctrine of total depravity and um, you know, the effectual call. Uh, only God can do this because they're dead, because they're spiritually dead. The reason why they don't see who Christ is, right. the reason why they don't hunger for this this rest is because they're spiritually dead, and um, we can't shake them out of that, and we can't argue them out of it. Only the Holy Spirit can cause a dead person to come to life, and when they come to life, all of a sudden, that stomach starts grumbling, and they, they're, they're seeking after the bread of life. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Okay. Now, that's what kind of rest. Now, the next question is, who's able to enter into that rest? Oh, this is pretty straightforward. I think. Very straightforward. He says it in verse 3, we who have believed enter that rest. Okay. Again, we're, we're talking about um, the Israelites. He's, he's continuously drawing on the story of Israel in the wilderness. They've all heard the promises. God has given these promises. I'm going to bring you into rest. I'm going to bring you into this land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to go in front of you, and I'm going to drive out the Canaanites. Um, Moses sends the 12 spies into the land. Um, they all see the giants. They come back to report to to Israel, and only Joshua and Caleb believe. Mm-hmm. They, they've all seen it. They've all heard the same promises, but only those who believe enter into the rest. Mm. Um, the the ten spies that don't believe, they're killed on the spot. Right. Um, Joshua and Caleb, they believe. Uh, the the Israelites, the the grown the adult Israelites, they don't believe, and so they fail to enter into God's rest. It's only those who believe that enter into God's rest. Mm-hmm. Those who those who rebel, they um, they perish in the wilderness. Yeah. And what's interesting is that he ties it so. So in uh, in chapter three verse eighteen he says, uh, or in verse uh, verse nineteen he says they were unable to enter because of unbelief. In chapter four verse six he says that um, they failed to enter because of disobedience. And so this idea of of belief and obedience are tied together. So the the the, the unbelieving Israelites they refused to go in. Why did they refuse to go in? Because they, they didn't believe. Right. Joshua and Caleb, they believed. And what did their belief lead them to do? Let's go, let's go kill some giants. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so it, it's tied together. Faith, faith and obedience are tied together, much in the same way we see it in James yeah. um, chapter two. Faith without works is dead. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, not the, it's not the people that just give lip service to Christ. Mm-hmm. It's those who actually follow him in obedience right. who are the ones who are really believing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, looking at the context of, of the, the recipients of the letter, it's not those who are giving lip service to Jesus, but then they go back to the temple because, well, no one's going to right. persecute me. Mm-hmm. It's those who say, I believe in Jesus, even if they come and take everything from me and, and kill me. Right. Yeah, we can uh, make some modern applications, I think, here um, uh, to faith and obedience. It'd be like the early Christians, though there were, there could have been those who struggled with, uh, like, you know, uh, Jesus is, uh, I believe who he is, who he says he is, but I really like my Roman lifestyle. Right. Like, I'll keep all of my, uh, my side girls. Yeah. Because, you know, a Roman man, mm-hmm. his wife's just nothing. She exists to make babies for Rome. Right. And he's got, like, other side <clears throat> girls for pleasure and pro- probably boys, too. Yeah. So many of them had boys as well. And he's like, eh, I'll take Jesus, but you know what? Eh, don't judge me. Yeah. And then the Christians would be like, hmm, maybe you aren't a Christian. <laughs> yeah. Because this is what our Lord has mm-hmm. said and his apostles have said right. Christians are to do and be, right? Yep. And we have the same struggle today, mm-hmm. right? You've got people in America today, everyone saying they're a Christian, they're pro-abortion, mm. pro-LGBTQ, yep. trans, the whole nine, Yeah. right? And then you have other Christians who be like, hey, uh, 
but we follow the Bible, and the others are like, "Don't judge me." Yeah. <laughs> oh well, the who word, are you? Look the at word, you. If you really translate that word correctly, it's not homosexual. Right. 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 Uh, <laughs> yeah. And we're like, no, hey, we're just trying to count the cost to follow Christ here. Right. We're we're just saying like God's revealed to us how to how to follow Jesus, and we're just following Him. It mm-hmm. seems to us like you're just making up new rules. Like uh, you say you believe, but when it comes to living as a Christian, you, you just won't. go with the culture, right? It, mm-hmm. It'd be the same, right? The people in the wilderness. Oh, we really believe, but we're just not going to go in. You know, there's giants and yeah, you know, but, but you we're know, real it's, believers. It's the uh, it's don't the, judge you know, us. Good good luck, Joshua and Caleb. We're all we're all counting on you. <laughs> yeah, don't don't judge us. We because right. you know right. we uh, you guys are just Canaanite phobic. <laughs> and uh, you just want to eradicate them from the earth, <laughs> right? Oh, your God just loves genocide. <laughs> yeah. It's... We're the real believers here. We're staying in the wilderness. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, this because is that's, how you reach, that's how you reach your unbelieving neighbor, right? Mm-hmm. You stay out in the wilderness. And that's them. what we have today. We got people saying they're Christians. Right. They live in the wilderness. They refuse to enter the rest. Yep. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that we follow Jesus perfectly. We stumble. Sure. We fall. Um, this is written so that we might not sin, but mm-hmm. if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Right. Right. Jesus forgives us of our sins. We're we're we are justified always and only by Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's never right. it's never by our works. We're justified by Jesus at the beginning of our walk, and we are continuously justified by Jesus for the rest of our Mm-hmm. Our lives, right? We will not stand. We will not enter into God's rest by any other standard than Jesus alone. Right. That's right. That's good. All right. Um, so let's get to the third question. When is it available? Well, you can uh, if you are a if you're a highlighter, you can highlight the word because it's over and over and over again today. Mm-hmm. That word is used five times in this warning passage today. If you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts Mm -hmm. today. So the rest has been available from creation. That's that's what Genesis 2 is all about. It's it's open, um, but Israel failed to enter it because Mm -hmm. of their unbelief and their disobedience. But unless someone thinks that the door has been slammed shut and that there is no more rest for, for sinners to enter into... David in Psalm 95, long after the events of Numbers 13 and 14, he says, today. So there is still rest available to God's people mm-hmm. today. Um, and this is, um, I, I think this is an important, uh, a really important point to, to press into people because there are a lot of people that feel like they're, they've sinned too much, they're, they're just too far gone. I've counseled I've counseled someone who has thought that they've committed the un, the unpardonable sin and just trying to get this person to believe that today, if you hear God's voice, follow Christ, repent of your sins and follow Christ. You're not too far gone. But at the same time, on the other hand, today is emphasized so that you're not, you don't in your arrogance think, well, I've got tomorrow. Right. It's, he doesn't say tomorrow. Right. He says today. Mm-hmm. Um, because if today you harden your your heart, well, tomorrow your heart's going to be probably even harder, mm-hmm. right? So today, the 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 rest that God is offering is for anybody that hears His voice today mm-hmm. um, to repent and turn and and follow Jesus, mm-hmm. um, as long as it's today. Okay. That's what we're supposed to do back in chapter three, verse thirteen: exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today. Um, where this is an ongoing process of we need to be exhorting each other today. Mm-hmm. Don't wait. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait until next week. Every day we need to be encouraging one another so that we'll enter into God's rest. Good. All right. Last question then. How do we enter? How do we enter that rest? Uh, through Christ. <laughs> I think, we made, that, Christ, I think right? we made that one. It's through clear. Christ. I mean, it, I mean, this it's kind of tongue in cheek as I was leading people along in right. this point because it's obviously Jesus. It's it can't be our works. Um it it has to be Christ. But it's it's interesting the way that he he goes about it. And um the way that I'm interpreting verse 10 is certainly not without um opposition. 
there are people that interpret verse 10 um, in a different way. So we've got verse verse 8. If Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from, from his. So Joshua did not bring Israel into rest. He brought them into a temporary rest. Mm-hmm. But the, the land of Canaan, it was always um, just a shadow of, of the, the reality. So I, I use the illustration of the appetizer. Like you order an appetizer, it's good. Um, it takes the edge off your hunger, but it's not the meal. Mm-hmm. Like it's not the steak dinner or the trailer before a movie, you know, of a movie. The trailer is not the movie. Now, sometimes really bad trailers give away everything, but just go with me on this, right? Mm. A trailer, a good trailer is supposed to kind of pique your interest um, in the movie. Mm-hmm. You're not satisfied with the movie. It's like the uh, the No Way Home trailers. Like, we got just enough to ask all these questions. Yeah. <laughs> we have no idea what's going on, but it looks awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but it leads you to want to watch the movie, right? That's what the promised land was supposed to be. It was not supposed to be the goal. It was supposed to be a tool to cause God's people to look forward to God's rest. Mm-hmm. And the saints of the Old Testament, they recognize that. You go to Hebrews chapter 11, and and he says that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they were looking forward to a better country, mm-hmm. that they were not satisfied with, with just the land of Canaan. Mm-hmm. They knew that that was anticipating a heavenly country. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Joshua couldn't bring them into that rest. Right. We see that in, you know, as soon as he dies, <laughs> judges, judges occurs, mm-hmm. and the people of Israel just go insane. Um, but God has promised to his people something better. That's why in Romans chapter 4, uh, Paul can tell, tell us that Abraham was promised that he would be an heir to the world. Mm. So it, it was never just this little piece of land um, in, in the Middle East, it, it always was pointing to something greater. Uh-huh. And so someone greater than Joshua has to bring the people in because uh-huh. Joshua, he's a sinner um, and he dies and he can't change the people's hearts. Uh-huh. Uh, we need someone that can do all of those things. We need someone that can change their hearts and he is not a sinner and he doesn't die and that can only be Jesus. Okay. Yeah, good. So there is a, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God because that's that's what's going on in verse 10, the reason why there is a Sabbath rest for the people of God, an ongoing promise of rest, is because of verse 10. Right. Um, and this is where I think the ESV translates this wrong. So the ESV, um, they they don't just translate the Greek uh, straightforward. They, they put an interpretive spin on it. So it doesn't say whoever. That's plural, right? Mm-hmm. That, that kind of gives the, the, the sense of plural. It, it really is a single masculine participle. So it should be translated more as uh, the one who has entered his rest or he who has entered his rest, something like that. Right. Um, and they insert God into the passage where it doesn't say God. Um, it doesn't say um, the one who has entered God's rest. It says the one who has entered his rest. So... It, it it's left up to uh you got this pronoun and it's you don't you have to do some uh you know some digging to interpret what's going on what's interesting is that throughout this passage everything that he's talked about for christians has always been in the plural it's always us it's we um he talks about you in the plural and then when he gets to verse 10 all of a sudden it's singular i think that's important um, now, this is not something that I'm coming up with. This is John Owen. John Owen has a big section on this. And he says that the Christian doesn't enter into his own rest. He enters into God's rest. But this person here is entering into his own rest. So who could it possibly be? Mm. Who, who is it that was talking in you know the Gospels about how yeah. his father's always working mm-hmm. and he's working as well? Um, he says that whatever I see my father doing, I do, I do it. Also, right? Mm-hmm. I think he's talking about Jesus. I think all of a sudden verse 10 is talking about Jesus. The reason why there's a Sabbath rest for the people of God is because Jesus has entered into his rest. Yeah. Um, so God, God has rested from his work of creation, and he rested. 
right? Jesus has finished his work of redemption and he's rested. Mm -hmm. He's he's entered into his rest. And now we who are in Christ, we enter into Jesus' rest. Yeah. We enter into the rest of God. But yeah. it's, it's only because Jesus has done it. Yeah, I think but, that's pretty clear. You know, some of the some of the more modern commentators they they treat it as it's talking about Christians. Uh-huh. So the who what whatever Christian has entered God's rest has rested from His work as God has rested from His. And then they're left to say, all right, what does He mean by they've rested from their works? Right. Like what works have they rested from? They rested from their sin and from you know works righteousness and God didn't rest from those things. Like that's not the rest that God rested from. I mean, He rested from His complete work. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if you if you go that way, you can. I mean, I don't think it's a a deal breaker, right? I just think that fitting in with the with the theology of Hebrews, where Jesus is, um, He's the forerunner, He's the apostle and high priest of our faith. He has gone through the heavens, and He's uh, you know Hebrews chapter ten, He sat down. He's made a once for all sacrifice and he sat down. What's another word for that? Rest. He rests, right? <laughs> he rested from his labors. And now we can we can enter where Jesus is already gone. Mm-hmm. Um so I think verse 10 is is talking about Jesus. Yeah. Um That's I, good. It, the more I think about it, the more I, I think about everything that he's talking about in Hebrews, the clearer it it becomes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's clear. I think yeah. that's good. And so I think so now let's deal with the, the question. Because I think if I think what all of what you said is true, and I think it has big implications for um, how you would interpret Sabbath and, and the Christian Sabbath and well, all that, of these things. That's what's interesting. I take kind of a um, an eclectic view mm-hmm. because every commentator that I read that interprets verse ten as Jesus interprets verse nine as a Sabbath day. Um, which is really weird. Yeah, it is. So I'm, I'm looking at this. I was really kind of anxious about this passage because of verse 9 mm-hmm. and trying to figure out what is happening here. <laughs> what is what is going on? So, because he does, he uses the word rest throughout this passage, and then when he gets to verse 9, he actually uses the word sabaton, which means Sabbath keeping. So let's, uh, let's break down the kind of issues for those who aren't kind of up on this stuff. Yeah. All right. So there are some in the Christian world today, which I think, I think it's, uh, I can, I guess I can understand their position. I think they're way off base, but they literally keep a Saturday. Okay. So yeah, Seventh Day Adventist. Yeah. Um, and, I think and, there's, I think there's they, even like a Seventh Day Baptist. There is, and there's a, there's a Hebrew, um, is it Hebrew roots? Is that what they call it? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and there's another Hebrew like movement kind of around this area too. I can't really. I don't know what the name is. I don't for them, know. But they keep Saturday. I'm not sure what uh, Messianic Jews do. I'm not. I'm not sure right. what they. Um, what they do, but they keep Sabbath. They try to keep Sabbath. Yeah, right? uh, and um, you know, seventh, in the Old Testament sense, right? Seventh Day Adventists they'll go so far as to say that uh, worshiping on Sunday is the mark of the beast, right? Um, and they they treat it that seriously. And there's, you know, there's all this stuff. Constantine changed the day, and <laughs> all of this, and it's. Christians began worshiping early, uh, right away on the seventh right day. Right away on the and, and Jews on the first day. So when I when first I preached day. from they, John, they worship on the first day. Yeah, right? yeah the first day yeah. The, uh, on the resurrection day. Right. So when I was preaching through John and I got to the section on the resurrection, yeah, it's one of the evidences I gave. If you remember that, yeah, powerful evidence for the resurrection is that Jews stopped worshiping on Saturday. Right. How can you explain that? Mm-hmm. Except for that, Jesus actually came back and they saw him alive. Right. They start worshiping God on Sunday um, early. You have evidence of this from Roman historians to other uh, letters from Pliny the Younger to Trajan, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, talking about how he's tortured and interrogated Christians, yeah, and how early on the first day mm-hmm. they rise before the sun comes up. Right. They gather together. They have a meal, the Lord's Supper, yeah. they sing hymns to Christ as God. Like, it's all there, man. Right. And then they go to work. Some of the... So um, there's the thing, right? Right. Then they go to work. Yeah. Like, so 
so it, what's interesting is that some of the um, some of the church fathers they they start talking about the first day of the week as the eighth day, mm. and they're they're going back to to Genesis, right? Like there's there is the seventh day, but there is an eighth day that's right. that is the messianic era. It's the it's the era of of salvation, uh-huh. um, and so if you if you ever read some of the the church fathers and they're talking about the eighth day that's what they're talking about right. they're they're talking about they're talking about sunday so it switched worship switched okay so there there's those people that are kind of minority but in our circles what would be more common is to make the sabbath itself be changed to sunday right so uh, this would be the sabbatarian view this would be the westminster the 1689 um you you read the article on the Lord's Day, and they say it's the Christian Sabbath, uh-huh. so they'll call it the Christian Sabbath, um, and they will they'll describe it as a day in which we're supposed to gather and worship. Um, they're supposed to be public and private um, worship, um, works of mercy, works of necessity, um, and a resting from secular employment, uh-huh. from work, from um, you know your hobbies, right. things like that. Um, some of the, I mean, and there's a spectrum. Some of them will say, um, I mean, some of them will not cook a meal on on Sunday. They'll right. prepare a meal on Saturday night for Joel, Sunday. Some so, will not. Some will not travel. I yeah, Joel, Joel Beakey. Joel Beakey would not travel. So he okay. came. He, you know, he's a great lecturer. Right. And they had to schedule his flight for like Monday. Like red eye, okay. After Sunday, so he would be he would be um, a more strict yeah. Westminster. I listened to Vody, and Vody um, said that you know if he if he preaches on a Sunday and he has nothing the rest of the day, he's not going to be waiting around in a hotel room to get back to his family. He'll he'll catch a flight on Sunday to to go home. Mm-hmm. So and he's a 1689 guy. So so there's there there's a spectrum on how people practice the Christian Sabbath. Right. Yeah. Some some won't won't eat out on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Guess, no guess. no shopping. Right. Right. So that's that's the Sabbatarian reform view. Yeah. That and would the, be more that would be more uh, Puritan Puritan right. view. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. I struggle to see how Sunday becomes a Sabbath day. Um. I we set the day apart for worship. To the Lord, like we worship on Sunday, uh-huh. I, th- I think that's the norm. I don't think it'd be a sin if certain circumstances arose and you needed to worship on Saturday, but I think the norm would be to set Sunday aside yeah. to, to remember the resurrection uh-huh. and to worship the Lord. And for me, that's keeping that's keeping sab- Christian right. Sabbath. So a lot of them, a lot of them will use verse nine as evidence that. There's still a, and this is a word, sabaton. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. Mm. Um, it, some people say that the author of Hebrews actually coined this word, that it, it's not found anywhere else. It's <laughs> found, it's found in some. I can't remember where the other place is, but it's not, it's not found in in like Christian writings uh-huh. um, before. You know, it's not really any even Jewish writings. I don't think. Um, Septuagint may have it. I cannot remember, but anyway, it's translated as Sabbath keeping. Uh-huh. Um, and so they look at it and they say, "Look," he said, "that there still there still remains a Sabbath, a Sabbath keeping for the people of God." And they they and they put that together with the first day worship. It's very obvious throughout the te- right. you know the New Testament that the Christians are worshiping on the first day of the week. Paul says at the end of First Corinthians on the first day of the week when you gather, um, you know, take a collection. Uh, John is worshiping on the Lord's Day, which would be the first day of the week. So they 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 put those together and they say the Sabbath has been moved to the first day of the week. And here's one of the evidences: is there still a Sabbath? And it's it's it is as the Jewish seventh uh, you know seventh day Sabbath on Saturday was looking back to creation. The Christian Sabbath is looking forward in anticipation to new the, creation to the new creation. Yeah. And so we need to rest from our labors as we look forward. I, you know, I'm not going to quibble over this stuff. I, I, I think that I think Romans chapter 14 comes into play here. One right. person esteems one day yeah. is more important than the other. I, I think. Um, 
but I have a really hard time as I'm reading it. If you just read through, he's talking about if you, something greater. He's talking about this greater rest. Yeah, if you just take it in the and context I, of Hebrews, which you should always do first, right, right. for biblical interpretation, stick with this this before you go anywhere else. And it yeah. seems to me he's speaking about resting in God in Christ. Yeah. And I, I have a hard time with, you know, you're talking about rest, and then he, in verse 9, all of a sudden he's talking about Sunday. Right. I, it just seems really awkward to me. And, and when I read the arguments, because I've been reading a lot of, of Sabbatarians on this, it it just doesn't it doesn't convince me. I know there's people, maybe people that are listening that are, are convinced that Sunday is the Christian Sabbath. I just I'm just not convinced. Uh, I'm with you. I think that um, we should worship on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, because we are celebrating the resurrection. I think that what he's talking about here is is the the Jewish nation, and this is I mean this is a really big subject. We we have to talk about whether the Sabbath was a creation ordinance, um, the continuation of the Ten Commandments. Right. I mean this. I mean it's big. Sure. Yeah. Um, but trying to keep it here within Hebrews, I think that what's going on is that the Jewish Sabbath was was a reminder of God resting, uh-huh. and not just as a day of rest, but as a remembrance that we too are invited to enter into God's rest. Uh-huh. Like He gives to Israel His Sabbath. He doesn't give it to the other nations. He explicitly says in Exodus, I've given to you my Sabbath, um, so that they are anticipating this greater rest. Uh Um, But now that Christ has come, we don't need that Jewish Sabbath to remind us of that, because Christ has come. We have the the fulfillment of the shadows. Uh So Paul in Colossians chapter 2, he says, you know, um, don't let anyone... Don't let anyone, you know, um, I don't know if he says enslave, but he says, uh, you know, based on um, feast and new moons and Sabbaths, these are the shadow, but the reality or the, or the I, I think it's even... Substance. I think it's substance, yeah, um, is Christ. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't read this in the sermon because it, it would have just gotten us completely sidetracked. But I put this in my notes because I knew we were going to talk about this. Mm-hmm. I knew this was going to come up. So this is Calvin. Mm-hmm. So I like what Calvin said. So it's a it's a little bit longer, but I think it's helpful okay. because I hold to Calvin's view. Okay. And Calvin is not. I mean, he wouldn't be reformed enough. <laughs> he wouldn't be able to hold to. Yeah. He wouldn't be able to hold to the Westminster or the 1689 because of his view on the Sabbath. Huh. So here's what he says. Um, and and he's talking about. This. This mm. is from his Hebrews commentary. Okay. So this is not out of context. This is he's commenting on verse nine. He says, But I doubt not, but that the apostle designedly alluded to the Sabbath in order to reclaim the Jews from its external observances. For in no other way could its abrogation be understood except by the knowledge of its spiritual design. He then treats of two things together, for by extolling the excellency of grace, he stimulates us to receive it by faith, and in the meantime, he shows us in passing what is the true design of the Sabbath, lest the Jews should be foolishly attached to the outward rite. Of its abrogation, indeed, he does expressly speak, for this is not his subject, but by teaching them that the rite had a reference to something else, he gradually withdraws them from their superstitious notions." For he who understands that the main object of the precept was not external rest or earthly worship immediately perceives by looking on Christ that the external rite was abolished by his coming. For when the body appears, the shadows immediately vanish away. Then our first business always is to teach that Christ is the end of the law. That's good. So he, so I, 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 take, I take Owen's view, even though Owen was a Sabbatarian, I take his, his view of verse 10. Uh-huh. But I take Calvin's view of verse nine. Yeah. So I'm just kind of, eh. I'm just kind of, you know, I, I think that's, I think that is what makes sense. I, I don't yeah. think that all of a sudden he's talking about um, a day, though. I do think that, like you said, I think that we should worship on the Lord's day. Uh-huh. Uh, and but how do we do that? Um, the most I would say is that we need to, um, unless providentially hindered, we need to worship together. 
With, on yeah. the Lord's Day. We need to worship together, and we need to remember the resurrection. And we are anticipating that future rest. We, we are coming together, and we are we're exhorting one another every day <laughs> so that we'll enter into God's rest. But um, this idea that you can't go to work, you can't you know, go anywhere. Now, I think that we, we can talk practically. Um, it's really hard for us to invite somebody to church who is working at a restaurant that we're eating at on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Like, practically, we need to think about some of these things. They can't come, <laughs> and we're part of the problem. Mm. Um, but I don't think that that's a hard and fast rule. I don't, I don't think we can lay down a law and say, um, you absolutely cannot go out to eat on a Sunday. But I do think that we can think in practical terms, all right, I want this person to go to church instead of work, working. Well, the only way in which they're going to be able to go to church is if people stop going out to eat on Sunday. Mm-hmm. So we can think about those things and we can wrestle with those things, but I don't think that we need to feel yeah. like we're sinning against God um, because we've talked about this before. The, the early Christians, they, they worked on the first day of the week. Like That wasn't the weekend. Um, you, you went to work on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a reason why they had to worship early or late. Right. Um, I think there's a reason why... In 1 Corinthians 11, the rich people are eating all the Lord's Supper and getting drunk on the wine mm. before the poor people can come, mm-hmm. because the poor people are working, yeah. and they have to they have to wait until they are done with their work to go worship. Yeah. Um, I think there's a reason why Eutychus falls asleep, um, and he, he falls out of the window. Mm-hmm. I think he's been working all day, mm-hmm. and so he's, he's listening to Paul late into the night, and he falls asleep, and falls out the window, right? And he dies. He dies. <laughs> so I, I think that we see that the early Christians, they, they did work, mm-hmm. but they did also find time, even if it was, you know, we've got Christians that don't work on Sundays and they still don't come. Yeah. Um, we've, you know, you look through history and we should be ashamed of ourselves. The early Christians, they still worked on Sunday, but they got up early in the morning before the sun came up because they realized this is important. Mm, we need yeah. to be together to worship. And we've got people that don't don't work on Sundays. In a lot of uh, cases, they don't work on Saturday or Sunday, and 1030 is too early for them, yeah. right? So yeah. we, we need to be uh, ashamed of that, and we need to, um, we need to recognize that um, there may not be a, a, you know, an exact command for us to do this, um, but uh, who are we to change the day of worship <laughs> that Christians for 2,000 years have been gathering on the Lord's Day um, to worship? Who are we to say, you know what, that's not important. Right. I, I think we still should do it. Um, and we do this because of Christ, yeah. who has, um, he is bringing us into his rest. Good. Yeah, we better shut it down. Okay. We went a little bit long, but good stuff. Uh, hopefully this has been beneficial to you, and hopefully you have entered into rest through Christ. And if you haven't, that invitation is open today. You simply come to him by faith, uh, believing he is who he said he is, that he died for our sins, that he rose again on the third day, and he welcomes anyone who will come to him. So I hope that you will come, enjoy the rest of God, and... Um, If you've been a Christian a while, hopefully this has helped you to become more and more conformed to Christ. If it has, please like, subscribe, share. As always, uh, this is our joy, and hopefully it's helped you, and we'll see you next time.